Well, if you'll be so kind to read the scripture, we're in Romans chapter 12. We're reading one through two. And like we always like to talk about in this Sunday school class, this is one of the few times that we have an opportunity to kind of stand because of the Holy Word of God. So let's stand while Bill reads Romans 2 or 12, 1 through 2. Go ahead, Bill. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The word of God for the people of God. Very good. Okay. Well, folks, today uh, the, the Sunday school lesson is trailing what uh, Bill Orndorff, uh, his sermon was today on whose will is it anyway? And so as we uh, proceed ahead, just want to draw your attention to the fact that um, next Sunday, next Sunday, Bill and I will be um, actually doing kind of a panel discussion uh, back and forth about this very scripture. And so um, uh, tune into that or attend. Um, a couple of you that are on the call, if you would mute yourself, I would appreciate it because uh, we're getting feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope you can too. Okay. They don't know you're back in the meeting, Doug. They're having What's that? They don't know you're back in the meeting. They don't know I'm back in the meeting. Okay, well, we'll try to get through. Thank you. Um, so as you look at your outline today, we really begin with um, we really begin with scripture that's dealing with um, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, which is one of my life's verses uh, from the Living Bible. It says, "For I know the plans I have for you," says the Lord, "plans for good and not for evil, to give you a hope and a future." So. Um, that is a critical verse as we think a little bit about what Bill's lesson was today from Romans 12, 1 through 2. And so as, as we can appreciate um, the plans that God has for us. And, um, I love you too. Bye-bye. Okay, whoever I think, has the I think it's Miss Betsy. Miss Betsy Solenberger. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, Bessie Solenberger, are you on the line? Everybody. <laughs> my name. <laughs> yep. You might want to mute Bessie. All right, I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. All right, very good. So um, let's look at our outline now, and and I want you to recognize that that Bill used as a secondary verse today, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, and that was an interesting period of time for the Israelites. Uh, they had actually been dispersed. Uh, the despotoria is what it's called in Greek, and and they were in a place where they were dispersed uh, in various kingdoms. The main kingdom here is Babylon had invaded them and taken them captive, and they were literally um, uh, kind of washing their clothes, uh, living out of and camping near the Tigris and Euphrates River that runs through Babylon, current Babylon today. And um, as they were there, they would often gather together and have their religious services uh, besides the, the river. And they are lamenting. And, and I want you to understand when we say lamenting, they know that their, their cherished Jerusalem, which is the center of their cultural, political, and religious entities, has been destroyed by Babylon. They've been captured and hauled off. Um, they've lost all their properties. They have lost all hope. And God gives Jeremiah this word. 
and, and, and basically Jeremiah begins to share this word with the Israelites. So I want you to think about this. These people are at a very low point in their lives. They are literally wondering what can God possibly have in store for us that's good here. And then all of a sudden, Jeremiah, who they all know is a prophet of God, they trust that he's a prophet of God. He says, uh, God says to say this to you. I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a hope and a future. And they're in Babylon, having been taken captive. They've lost everything that they own. They have no hope at all. And then that's what this guy says for them to do, that God has plans for their future. So I want you to think that they are in a tough spot. And, and Bill pointed out to us today that, that many in the world feel exactly the same way, that we are in this tough spot. Um, there's not a lot of hope. Uh, a report just came out this week that uh, GDP is down 32.9%. Uh, that's the greatest single quickest drop in the history of America. It's even worse than the Great Depression that triggered uh, when they went into the Great Depression. Um, we have no hope of when this is going to, when we're going to come out of this and uh, when we're going to be able to start thinking in terms of, of being back to normal, normal, you know, the quote marks. Um, so I think Bill's message is very timely for us and it, it really makes us begin to appreciate what do we need to do and how do we need to do this? So if you look back at Romans 12, 1 through 2, at the beginning it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy. So where do you think God's mercy is in, in the current time that we're in, in, in the current place that we're in in this world? It says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So if, if, um, if one of us says that to each other, I, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, how do we look at the rest of the world and say that there is mercy? I mean, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic. The world shut down. People are suffering. They're lonely. They're, they're fearful. Um, there is tremendous uncertainty. So in view of God's mercy, what, what, how do we identify this? Anybody care to answer that? Well, Doug, where my mind goes is, you know, it, as bad as it is, it can always be worse. I mean, it, this could be something that was deadly with no treatment at all. And, and we've gotten, we've made progress. And in a way, it's brought us all together and, and united us, showing us that no one is exempt and we, we all have something in common. So, Laura, a, a great answer. Um, that is often viewed as the, oh, my Lord, you don't understand how worse it could be, right, kind of answer. Um, and, and that's fair. But a lot of other people would say, you don't know how tough I have it now. Um, you know, you're, you're still working. I'm not. Um, there are people who are saying, I, I'm losing my life savings slowly uh, or very quickly in some cases. So um, I, I don't see any mercy here. I don't see it getting better. So how do we respond to people there? Well, Doug, it's like I tell everybody with this pandemic. I put all my trust and faith in God. And if he has me going home with this virus, I'll see y'all up yonder in a little while. So, Omer brings up a great point that some people would say that um, we have his mercy because we know where we're going to end up. And, and that's a good response, too. What about for those that don't believe the way we do? Where is God's mercy in this? 
I think it's in us because this is the time when we're supposed to separate ourselves from the other people like getting sucked in by the TV or whatever, but to rely on God's Holy Spirit to get out there and show others that we truly are the hands and feet of Christ and how we can help them in some way. Good response, Pam. Good response. Um, Bill? Doug, one of the things when you think about mercy in from my lens is why do we even need mercy to start with? It's, it's because of our sinful nature. And so regardless of what's going on in the world, and um, there still has always been a sinful nature. And we recognize that God has offered us mercy inside of our sinful nature. And that means not only when things are going well, but during troubling times that we, that we go through um, just daily, right? Like we're going through now and it's hard to understand things. And, you know, again, I, from my lens, you know, I was thinking how on earth could we even see God's will or plan during this. And so in view of God's mercy means I still recognize it, my sinful nature and I still, I still recognize it, uh, the need of the mercy of Jesus to, to move on. And that, that, is, that is absolutely true. Um, so I want you to think about, and, and look, I, I, I'm intending not to be political here, but when the concept of American exceptionalism is, is brought about, I want you to recognize that in our world that you and I live in, uh, the wealthiest nation in the world, uh, the healthiest nation in the world, despite what you hear in the news media, um, the most protected nation in the world, the freest nation in the world. From our perspective, God has already given us mercy. So we can't begin to appreciate where others may be in this. Um, we begin to see um, what you would call the tip of the finger, right? Just the tip of the finger is all that we're seeing of, of hard living, of people who are struggling right now. And, and so I want you to appreciate that um, it is very difficult for us to, to maybe fully appreciate this part of Scripture. But as Bill kind of took us in that direction, and it's really where I was trying to get all of our minds to, and that is when we begin to talk about in view of God's mercy, we're really talking about the reality that God's mercy is given to all men that they don't get what they deserve. Okay, so um, what do we deserve? Well, if you look at the fact that we can't be perfect, that we struggle to figure things out, that we never attain the goodness that God desires from us, then we are given mercy by the fact that God does not bring judgment on us that we deserve. And so mercy is the beginning of grace, right? And grace is given to us because of the gift of Jesus Christ on the cross. So when we see this, look how it might sound if I read it a little differently to you uh, in 12.1. Therefore, folks, I want you to really understand this and recognize that God has already given us mercy. He sent his son Jesus to die for us. And now as a result of that, we are to offer, and that's the second part of that part of the question there, we're to offer your living, your bodies as a living sacrifice. So, you know, in view of what God's done for us, in view of the gift of Jesus Christ, Here's what I want you to go. Here, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to give yourselves as a living sacrifice to God. And what do you think that means? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Are we to go out here and wear ourselves out so much that our bodies just break down and we just give it totally to God? I mean, no rest. Um, we're doing everything that we can. We use every penny in our name. We use every bit of energy and focus and, and everything, and, and we just give it all to the church. Is that what he's talking about? Mm. 
I think he's talking about right living and being an example to others. That's perfectly fair, Laura. That's good. Anybody else? You know, Doug, when they when you talk about sacrifice, you know, you think about the I, I don't know if this is necessarily where Paul is going here, but nonetheless, you think about sacrifice, it was always about sacrificing the unblemished lamb, right? It was always about being sacrificing your best, right? Giving your best. Um you know, certainly we know Jesus was the was the final sacrifice for our sins, but I think what we're being tasked with here is how can we give our best? How can we give our best, you know, our whole our whole being, right? I don't know if that's what that means or not. That's just kind of what hit me when you were asking. I think that's a perfectly good response, Bill. I believe that Paul is driving us to think a little bit outside of what we do. So when we talk about sacrifice, we're talking about giving up something of value, okay? So I want you to remember that when we talk about when Jesus was consecrated in the temple, his parents brought turtle doves or, or two doves, if you will, which was the offering of a very modest and humble household. Uh, perhaps some would even say, uh, those who might be declared impoverished or in poverty. They were given the right to sacrifice something of very little value, but it's the only value that they had. So when we begin to, to read here that Paul's saying, look, in view of what God's done for you, this is what you're to do for God, right? And if you see it that way, you begin to understand that you're to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, meaning that it is no longer about only what I want. It's about what he wants. And to give something up in sacrifice is to give up something that you desire for the good of others. It would be when there's only one piece of pie left, who gets the pie, Katie? Who gets the pie, Katie? So, so it would be to give it up for somebody else. Because of your love for people, you are giving up those things that you want, right? So when we begin to talk about this concept of our bodies as a living sacrifice, he's talking about your world, your life, um, and that we are to provide it that what God needs us to do, we're willing to do. So let's keep on going because the rest of it begins to explain it even more. So it says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, and here's the part on your outline, holy and pleasing to God, holy and pleasing. Well, we, we all re recognize that we don't fit into the holiness scheme at least maybe just a little bit each day, but not much. Um, that we are holy and pleasing to God. So how can we be holy and pleasing to God in a world where we are sinful people? Bob Kurt, is there anything besides a background there? Yeah, I'm here. And the best way to be holy and pleasing is pretty much what Laura was saying. Do your best uh, to be a good person, to, be a, to, to love God and to listen to God. That's the message here. Listen to God and, and try to understand what God wants you to do. Anybody else? Yeah, Doug, you know, in other words, to be holy, I think we have to recognize that we cannot do that on our own. The only way that you have any opportunity to become holy is through sanctification, and that is God's work in you, nothing that we do. So, which ultimately means that you have to allow God, you have to submit and allow God to do his work in you. And, and one of the things that I read, I don't even know how many <laughs> sermons and information I read on this message, but, you know, so many of them talked about how often we mess it up, you know, and we, we don't get it right the first time. And, 
and the second time or the hundredth time, right? And it's, it's interesting how I believe, based on what I've read, God seems more interested that you just want to and, you know, allow him to work through you. And in that process, you know, you learn and you move forward down the path. And, um, so, yeah, becoming holy is, is, a, is a totally a God thing and not us thing. Yeah, that's well said. Um, you know, the, the fancy churchy term is sanctification, being, being made more holy. To be holy in Jesus' name, to be more like Jesus is another way to say it. it it's a form of grace that, that God gives us, that he continues to help us to grow, improve. You might want to use that term in your life to become better. But more importantly, Take yourself off the scale of goodness when it comes to holy because on your best day, your best hour, your best minute, your best second, we, aren't ho- we are not holy. So if that's the case, we can only be holy through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. By, by God living in us, we become holy. By our acceptance of Jesus dying on the cross, we become holy. And we become holy, but it doesn't mean that we become sinless. It means that God has made us holy, not our actions and behaviors. Now, that being said, if we are to be holy and pleasing to God, that means that we are on that pathway. We are seeking out God. We're making the effort. As Laura said, we are living the life, right? Even though we don't do it perfectly, even though we don't always do it right, even though sometimes we don't even get close, we are still called to be on that pathway. And then look at the end of of verse 1. It says, this is your true and proper worship. And I want you to note what it says in the NIV. It says, this is your true and proper worship. In other words, what does God desire from us? What kind of worship does he desire from us? He desires worship from us that says that we are willing to offer ourselves up for his kingdom, that we are willing to be holy through him, and we desire to please him. That is true and proper worship, right? So it's not about how good you sing. It's not about uh, how well you preach. It's not about the fact of how many Sundays you come to. It's not about how much off- money you put in the offering plate. It's the fact of that God calls us to live our lives and offer ourselves out to him and for his kingdom, right? Now let's go to 2. Uh, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And um, I can't help but recognize, and I, in fact, I want to read to you, um, as soon as I find it here, the, um, the message. Um, I just think some of this is pretty cool. So here's, here's what the message is um, in 1 and 2. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Changed from the inside out is a a very um, common way of describing sanctification to become holy, right? Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And Bill Orndolph and I next Sunday are going to spend some time talking about that very part of the verse because I think that is a powerful thing that we are talking about today and that we as, as believers need to walk in our faith walk, right? So, so what is conform? 
What is conform? Is it wearing a mask when you don't want to? Huh. Or is it not wearing a mask when you're told to? <laughs> yeah, that's, that would be the opposite of conform. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Anybody? What, what's conform? I think it's compromise. Compromise. Compromising your values. Okay. In the living word, it says don't copy others. Don't copy others. That's good, Barb. So think about conforming. Um, Joe Salyer was out at my shop not long ago, and, and, and he's helping um, uh, Carter Painter on a project, and, and they're trying to um, make something that has already been made. So they're duplicating it. They're, they're making it form to fit the other one and look like the other one. And maybe that's what happens to us. We, we don't want to stand out, so we want to fit in. We want to form ourselves to be like others. And we need to be careful with that because sometimes when we conform to the world, that means we become like everybody else. And if nobody can tell us apart from the rest of the world, then are we valuable to the kingdom? If we're like everyone else, then we don't stand apart. So what is the pattern? It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. What is that pattern? Blend in. Blend in. Mm-hmm. You ever heard the term, go along to get along? Go along to get along. I'm sure Bob and Omer, uh, those of you who've been in the military, uh, conforming and patterns were very important, right? And what was the ultimate objective, objective though, of you conforming and, and being part of the pattern? Bob may not have heard that because he's got the breeze blowing in the background and it's moving all that seagrass behind him. The ultimate goal is the mission of whatever group you were in. And sometimes nonconformance helped you. Um, that mission I've described recently to a lot of people read about um, where my friend says I saved his life, I I went out of my way. I mean, I, I I if I had asked somebody, they wouldn't have told me to do what I did. So the military isn't always about conformance. I don't know if that fits into it. This. It, it, it does. In fact, it brings a highlight to us that. Your recent story, Bob, I'm not on Facebook, but Katie, let me look at it. And, and uh, what a great story that was, right? And, and when you think about Frank's life was saved because somebody didn't conform. And so because Bob didn't conform, Frank's able to talk about it today. And so is Bob. And what a lesson for us, right? That, that because we aren't necessarily stuck in being like the rest of the world, because God calls us out of being like everybody else, and he calls us to be more like Jesus, who was different than everybody, right? Isn't that why Jesus was so hard to be accepted by the religious leaders of the day? Because he didn't conform. He wasn't the pattern that they were expecting. They missed him. They missed him because he wasn't like everybody else. So, yeah, go along to get along fits in some parts of our lives, but God's calling us out. And look where he says, the next part is, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, there are entire ministries that are that are around the word renewal 
and transformed. So when we begin to say transformed, doesn't transformed in your mind has a much bigger connotation than changed? It does to me. Transform sounds like it's so much of a bigger deal than just, hey, why don't you change a little bit? We're saying, why don't you be transformed? So I don't think it's an accident that Paul uses transformed here. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be changed by the renewing of your mind. It doesn't seem to have the power, does it, that, that transformed does. Transformed absolutely has power to it. And remember that we are transformed as a person when our mind is renewed to what God has called us to. That's a good one, right? Then I put this down at the beginning of that last sentence. Then you, then you. I want you to think about that. Two really simple, commonly used words. But what Paul is saying is, if you do these things, you will be transformed. You will be renewed. You see, you're being sanctified. You're being made more like Jesus. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's powerful stuff, right? So you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. How are we able to test and approve what God's will is? I mean, how could we possibly hope to do that? Anybody? John, I think, I think we do that by <clears throat> the um, confirmation we get from the Holy Spirit as to whether we're on track. And if I think sometimes it's easier to figure out when we're not on track. I think those underlying feelings make themselves more evident when we're not on track sometimes than when we are on track. That's good. That's good. Anyone else, Bob? Yeah, Julie said underlying feelings. And, and to me, that's, you know, it's kind of like um, we have a household now where there's four adults, five today, Aaron's home. Um, and if, if you see something that's out of place, you have this underlying feeling to pick it up and put it in where it should be. That's a silly little thing to talk about, but... It's, it's that underlying feeling. You want to be, you want to help. Um, and I, I know there's much, much more important examples, but this is what I feel every day. I, uh, and every one of us, the five of us, not necessarily Aaron all the time, not necessarily me all the time, <laughs> but we try to help each other. Yeah, from what I can tell, Bob, Aaron, Aaron, Bob, it's just an age difference, that's all. <laughs> so, look, we all have this feeling, I believe, deep down that we want to know what God's will is. And I do not, I want you to hear my heart here. I want you to hear my heart here, please. I'm not making light of it. I'm not cutting anybody down because I have the same feelings that maybe you do. We make figuring out God's will a very complex task. It has, it's like a, a, a bowl of spaghetti. You can't really tell where it starts and where it ends, and you're trying to find the middle, and, and sometimes that's real. We've got to wrestle with it. We've got to fight with it. Most of the time, though, folks, God's will is pretty clear. And Bill gave us a couple of, of things on how we can be transformed, and it may help us to understand some of this. So 
and I, I apologize on your outline. I, I made us, I made God with a small G there in the outline. That was a smelt spelling error on my part, but there's really five things that, that Bill gave us tips on. And next, next Sunday, we're going to spend more time on this. Okay. We're going to go in this deeper, but believe in God, know God study. In other words, Bible study is a great way. Trust God. That's the third way. Wait on God patiently and then obedience to God. So those are five quick tips on how we are transformed. And it also, I would submit to you that it is a way that we are able to test and approve what God's will is in our life. So if you heard Doug Renker say that figuring out God's will is easy, you, you didn't, I didn't communicate well or you didn't hear well. I believe sometimes it is that bowl of spaghetti that you can't figure out where the start and the end is in the middle. And, and it, it, it looks like they're all connected and they aren't. They're individual strands and, and yet they're all wrapped around each other. And, and there's so much interrelationships that we have to appreciate. I do want you to understand, though, that God's will can be difficult to get the final answer. Generally speaking, the basics of God's will is really clear. And Bill chose scripture that lays that out for us. In view that God gave us mercy, he gave us grace when we didn't earn it, deserve it, and shouldn't have had it. And because he did that, we need to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to the rest of the world, to our families, Maybe even sacrifice to yourself a little bit. Give up some things that you know aren't good for you so that you are sacrificing so that you can be more useful in the kingdom and to your family or to your church, to your friends, even to yourself. And then we can be holy and pleasing to God because of the gift of Jesus. And this is the kind of true and proper worship that, that God calls us to experience that we finally realize that we are worthy, that we deserve it. We deserve it because God loves us, not because we've done anything, but we deserve it because he loves us and he wants the very best for us. So through all of this, if it's good, if it's pleasing, if it's perfect, it's God's will for you. And next week, we're going to spend some time talking more about the subject but it was a good introduction today. And uh, for those of you that were able to tune in, uh, either come in here or tune in and uh, watch Bill's sermon, I think we have uh, fixed all the damage that he did uh, this morning. And uh, next Sunday, we'll fix a little bit more together. Um, <laughs> Bill, I'm so thankful that I was able to get that in like that, slide that one right in. But listen, folks, um, I hope you have a fantastic week. Um, I will say that next Sunday, um, Bill and I, like I said, are going to be uh, kind of in a, 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 a interview format, if you will. It's going to be the two of us talking in front of the church to kind of bring home this message a little bit. And uh, we look forward to that opportunity. Um, let's, let's end in a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we have an opportunity to challenge ourselves. Whose will is it anyway? We recognize, Lord, that sometimes it is complex to understand your will in our lives and what we're supposed to do. But most of the time, Lord, it's really fairly simple. You gave us the gift of Jesus. We are to offer ourselves up to you and to others. And as a result of that, that is the truest and purest form of worship that we can have. And that, Lord, you're going to conf not allow us to conform to the world, not allow us to be a pattern to this world, but rather to be transformed. Renew our minds through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.